Hello and welcome to the Jinnah Institute Conclave Ideas uh, uh, Ideas Conclave and uh, the topic in this on the discussion today is the relationship between growth inequality and taking care of marginalized communities uh, under conditions of uh, lockdowns under covid as well as slowing economic growth perhaps even recession uh, the uh, kind of conditions the pakistan's uh, economy is struggling with these days uh, we have a distinguished panel here to uh, explore these ideas with uh, so uh, let me make the introductions we have dr aisha horse pasha uh, who is a, uh, an economic researcher uh, based out of lahore she has been in mna in the in the previous government uh, uh, in this government and in mpa in the previous government from the uh, punjab assembly and she served as uh, finance minister of punjab she's been affiliated with the set, uh, with the spdc the social policy development center as well as the institute of public policy uh, in the past as well thank you very much for joining us dr aisha we also have dr zedi with us he's a political economist and executive director of the institute of business administration uh, in karachi as well as an author of numerous books on pakistan's economy uh, so thanks very much for agreeing to be with us on this panel we also have dr afsan sajad akhtar also a political economist uh, at the qadiyazm university and still right maybe we can have a conversation since we are going live so uh oh he's i think he's back no he's not no it's, we can continue salman do you want us to continue ah oh, he's back over here so people i believe we're all here uh, right now dr aisha i'm going to begin with you and uh, could you please help us uh, or, or, or tell us how do you see the relationship between growth and inequality uh over here especially in our country or in the or within the region in the past we there has been a strained relationship between these two uh but uh, overall as at least if we even think about it theoretically how do you approach it uh, thank you khuram i uh, this is a very important subject and a subject very close to my heart and let me give a start by giving you a south asian perspective here that in south asia we are at this point of time home to one third of the world's poor and this is a region which has demonstrated very substantial growth uh, for a number of years and uh, so clearly there is something wrong in the way we have been growing and i uh, would like to point out to you the fact that uh, what has happened is that we've experienced growth which has not been able to pull our people out of poverty and a big reason for this is that the growth has not been really uh, been um, uh, uh, very good as far as inequality reducing is concerned growth has not reduced inequality and because of that poverty reduction has not been achieved let me uh, give you some numbers for pakistan for example recently an old colleague of ours harun jamal has done some work in this area he has quantified in a consistent manner the elasticity is the relationships and according to his estimates 1% increase in growth can lead to a 1.3 13% decline in poverty uh, this is the relationship in pakistan and interestingly a 1% reduction in inequality can actually reduce poverty by 4.7% so look at this the 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 this, strong relationship which exists between reduction in inequality and reduction in uh, poverty and the not so strong relationship that exists between growth and poverty reduction so clearly our policies have not the growth strategy has really not been very poverty reducing in this region and pakistan included more so in india i guess but pakistan also included in this now what has covid the recent developments under covid have done to us Co uh, if uh, 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 you saying something because i can't hear you yes yeah, tatar i was going to say actually you left us with an important thought here so let's come to covid in a moment but let's just run with this for okay. a moment 
that uh, you're telling us that growth and inequality uh, or growth and poverty in fact the relationship between them is rather weak over here in uh, in, in in pakistan and yet we persist yet we persist in uh, and successive governments have persisted in seeing poverty alleviation uh, <clears throat> through the lens of growth uh, and i'm thinking over at least over the past 25 years i can think of only one government that perhaps has not approached the question of poverty alleviation and inequality to the lens of growth everybody else certainly does and i would include the present government in that category too so let so let, let me throw this to dr kuzedi there the political economist how do you see uh this relationship between poverty and growth as uh, uh as just uh, discussed by dr asha uh, and more more importantly if there is such a weak link between them why do successive governments persist in uh committing themselves to a strategy of high growth and selling that as a strategy for poverty alleviation So I don't agree with. If I can just add just sentence, the point I'm trying to make here is not that they they are not essential. Growth is not essential for poverty reduction. What I'm saying is that it's not sufficient. We need it's to have enough, the right kind point. of growth. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so I don't agree with Aisha at all. I don't agree with Aisha. Uh, in fact, I, I do think, uh, and there's a very distinct, uh, there's a very important distinction that I'd, I'd like to make. First is. i think that growth does tend to reduce poverty we've seen that in pakistan it's it and south asia which aisha started with which she won't disagree with here so i think that i mean you see that there's been a huge fall in poverty however we may, may, uh, measure it in south asia and pakistan as well from about 2003 4 to about 2010 i mean there's lots of evidence uh world bank independent studies which have shown that so i think uh, you know th- there is a i won't call it a correlation but i think there is a relationship which takes place with as growth increases uh poverty does tend to fall because it becomes more inclusive it uh, uh, allows more distribution to take place so that's something else. but for me at the moment um there's been there's been a lot of research on poverty and uh, uh all all of us are familiar with that i'm more interested in inequality because i think what's happened is that while growth uh, has been able to reduce poverty in south asia and pakistan it has also created far greater inequality so it's much easier to reduce poverty than it is to reduce inequality i think we need to make that distinction a lot of people use poverty inequality interchangeably they are two different things altogether two different political uh, philosophies two different ways of uh, looking at them for example you can re- you can reduce poverty by handouts the benzeer income support program is a very uh, useful mechanism of providing uh, 1600 3000 4000 whatever amount of money you want and you're lifting people out of the poverty trap but that is not removing inequality inequality is far more structural it's based on wealth creation you you you're muted what am i muted i am still getting used to these online things but uh... Uh, the, to be precise, the BISP and the social protection schemes under the you know that that operate out of the NC the NSCR uh, uh, database aren't really designed to alleviate. I mean, they're, they're not designed to pull people out of poverty. They're just probably designed to take the edge off it. They're income support programs, right? Aren't they designed to basically make the lives of those living in poverty a little bit easier? so as far as poverty alleviation goal i mean in terms of helping pull people out of poverty um, See, no. you, you you were sharing your thoughts on how growth will do that that, that that's what the conventional no, no, no. thinking I, has let, let's let's come back to this see if you if somebody earns below the poverty line and you give them a certain amount of supplement like the bank ben- ben- you take them out of poverty that's it's as, as simple as that so the benedir income support program is not alleviating poverty what it is doing is giving people to shift them out of poverty so i as i said i mean i i think it's more important to talk about inequality because as see growth when when growth takes place uh it the nature of growth the the the, the sectors that is taking place in the how wealth is being created that is particularly important and how that plays out in which sectors i can for example a very good example of this last 8 months is the fact that the tech sector in the united states amazon um uh microsoft uh, apple i mean they have made multiple times the wealth that they did in the last couple of years and that is creating far greater inequality at the same time when there is a poverty increasing as well in the in the united states 
So this it's important to remember that growth can take place and create far greater inequality, and still you've got growth taking place, while growth can take place and also reduce poverty. So I think we need to be very clear about that. To, to remove inequality or to reduce inequality, you have to look at the causes of why inequality exists in the first place. There could be ownership of assets, ownership of wealth, ownership of opportunities and things like that. So you have to address them. Poverty is simple and very simply a transfer of resources. So something like the Benazir Income Support Program, Zakat is also a means of reducing poverty because it lifts people up. But that's a short-term situ situation. So we need to be very clear about the two. Okay. Uh, Asim, I'm going to come to you. One. Yes, Asim, I'm going to come to you here. Uh, with this that how are you seeing uh, the the way in which inequality and poverty are both related to growth? And uh, do you think growth is in fact the way forward uh, for a for a state to address issues such as inequality and poverty, uh, or do you think that uh, additional policy uh, uh, what, what can we say, you know, uh, directions or uh, apparatus is needed uh, in order to address these problems? Yeah, I think um, the point that Akbar makes is, I think, is, is important. Um, and I think it's also worth bearing in mind, you know, you mentioned at the outset, that this is sort of something that you've observed, um, that successive governments have basically come in and made the same pitch, that if we grow quick, then somewhere along the line that that adds up to sort of whether it be poverty i mean these and it's important what akbar is saying these are two different things a reduction in poverty and a reduction in inequality i don't think that governments over the last 25 years have pitched the second they may have been saying we are are growing and therefore reducing poverty or at least claiming that and that, that's it's, a, it's one side of the debate but i don't think there's even a claim of inequality but just just to jog our memory a little bit this is not new right this is not new as in not just the contemporary period. You know, very famously, um, functional inequality was an, was an avowed uh, policy, uh, was the avowed policy regime uh, under Ayub, um, a very clear sort of notion that, yes, eventually this will trickle down. So, so, you know, there's been versions of the same throughout most of our history. And I think it's very interesting. Uh, we were talking just before we went live what the prime minister said to the WEF um, the day before yesterday, right? He said two things. One is um, Pakistan of 2020 is all about creating wealth. And then this, this rather interesting sort of um, aside where he said, and that's always been the case in Pakistan, except for, for when the socialists ruled us and profit making was a crime. And I think these are, these are telling sort of, um, sort of assertions here and relates to these questions that you are putting to us. Growth has more or less always been on the agenda. Growth is, is more or less, has always more or less relied on and in some ways rewarded those already with endowed sources of wealth. And as a result, at various points in time, mostly throughout our, our, our history, you've seen growth persisting alongside perhaps poverty alleviation, but I agree with Akbar, crucially also uh, rising inequality. There have been periods where inequality has reduced, has, has come down, and the 70s, interestingly, is one of those periods. Um, but for the most part, inequality um, has, has increased alongside when there's been growth spurts. Um, and, and then there's a question of poverty, which let's say in the pandemic world, you know, a lot of people have been pushed back down uh, from, you know, sort of certain kinds of income levels that you would say were, were moving out of poverty or certain forms of social mobility. Um, but yeah, I think the larger, longer term trend that I think is more important to trace and really speaks to the, you know, you asked why do governments just pitch this? And I think this is a political issue because you basically have a large segment of society, those without wealth, without assets, who are landless, who are, you know, a report came out yesterday, there's 23 million kids between 5 and 16 who are out of school, so they're not going to have opportunities for mobility through education. They're just, they just don't have political voice. So you can just pitch growth, perhaps give us some figures that say a certain, to a certain extent that's alleviating poverty, and inequality can continue to shoot through the roof, which uh, is, is what we've seen at, at different stage, at different points in our history.
Hi, Mr. So welcome uh, to, uh, uh, to 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 the broadcast. In uh, and uh, your thoughts on how growth inequality and poverty are connected here in Pakistan, and how they've been woven into the structure of policy. While you were finance minister, um, I, you know, I, I recall observing all your moves at that time, and I want to know how much did concerns of poverty and inequality actually weigh on your mind, and how much of your time was simply taken up by. Uh, issues such as arranging the euro bond flotation and uh, and seeing the various uh, uh, public sector development projects to uh, uh, to a successful close. Uh, thank you, Khuram. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, I I think in Pakistan uh, the finance minister's job is mostly firefighting. So I don't know whether I did enough to uh, to pay attention to these things. Uh, let me sort of uh, put in my two cents about this debate about in inequality and poverty. In Pakistan, given that we are a very poor country, um, really greater inequality almost has a one-on-one -on -one relationship with poverty. So if you have greater inequality, you'll have poverty. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to talk about, for instance, uh, in the early part of the, this century, a uh, few first few years under Musharraf, we had actually better growth, uh, but poverty was not uh, being reduced. Uh, but then uh, since the democratic dispensation you know, started, uh, we've actually had much slower growth, but uh, supposedly the poverty numbers have gone down, uh, although there's some controversy regarding this. Um, so uh, what this shows um, maybe is that there is a trade-off between you know, equity and efficiency. You know, this is something that we learned in economics, uh, that there is somehow a trade-off between equity and efficiency. But in Pakistan's case, I honestly think that, that if we actually increase equity, uh, we actually might just become more efficient, that we are such a discriminatory society towards the poor and towards uh, the less fortunate, uh, that we block a large section of society from participating in, 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 in meaningful economic activity, in value addition activity. And so if you, if for instance, you know, the ling linguistic divide, if people who don't speak English really don't get good jobs, I mean, if you like, that's like 85, 90% of people that you really basically just thrown out um, of the same comparative st economic struggles that my children would, would be, or, you know, your kids would be in. Uh, so this is a, I mean, this, the, we are an unequal society almost because of the design of our society. It's, it's, I mean, it, this is how we are. Um, it's a very difficult, harsh society, I tell you, uh, where, where poor and, 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 and lower middle classes and, and middle classes almost have no chance of advancing. Uh, they have no level playing field. Uh, even when you look at the government, and this is, this is an equal criticism of me or of anybody else. I mean, this is, we're not, I'm not at all being political about this. Uh, you can look at the entire history of political governments as well as uh, dictatorial governments. Uh, we never pay attention to these things. I mean, you know, yes, maybe may have one or two speeches a year by the prime minister or or, or, or the you know the elites, but uh, when have we paid attention? Look at this uh, COVID season, for instance. Uh, a state bank came up with these really these policies, which which were really beneficial to large industrial enterprises. You know, the average loan I think for 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 uh, towards uh, paying your your labor force. Well, I think 50 crore rupees or 500 million or something like this, you know, which is not a small enterprise in Pakistan. But you gave a lot of money to all these industries. But what about the barber shops, for instance? Uh, what about, you know, hair salons? What about small bakeries? Because they were not documented, nothing was given. The federal government right. gives thousands of billions of rupees in subsidies. But look at those subsidies also. They're either towards what is called producers of socialism, towards government employees. Okay, these subsidies go to government employees who are not poor. I mean, you know, like uh, whether it's PIA employees or, you know, like, you know, utilities or corporation employees and things like that. But more than that, uh, the, the most biggest beneficiaries of government subsidies are the very rich uh, because they have the most influence. They buy into these subsidies. So whether it's, uh, you know, the, the state bank giving, a, uh, for instance, this turf wonderful policy, which, you know, which is trying to industrialize. You're giving a 1% loan. Uh, basically, a one to two percent loan to industrialists in a country which has a ten percent inflation rate. To two percent loan means an eight percent subsidy, and for the next ten years, that's locked in. That's a huge subsidy to the rich. Uh, we we do some of these policies, you know, 
uh, based on old ideas or based on you know Western ideas and all that. But we've not not really realized that you know the, the vast majority of Pakistanis we've completely left behind. You know that. Uh, so, so the, the unequalness of the society, inequality in the society, actually now I think hampers um, uh, hampers our growth. And and if we would may were to make Pakistan a slightly more, even a slightly more equal society, we could grow. And 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 you know we've not even touched upon, and I think uh, Aisha may do this or Akbar Saab may do this, the regional disparities. You know, I mean, I mean, you know, if you are a poor kid from Balochistan, what chance do you have in Pakistan? Or even Fata, uh, so 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 uh, you know uh, wherever you look, there is so much inequality, and and and, and we have like I think as I said, that, you know, we, our our growth paradigm is just a growth paradigm. We've never looked at uh, inequality as as an objective that we need to uh, try to mitigate. Okay, there's lots to uh, to chew on over here. Actually, so I'm coming back to you, Doctor Aisha. But first, before anything else, let me throw back something that uh, Akbar said said during his, uh, his remarks, he pointed to the, in fact, rapid reduction in poverty that the Pervez Musharraf regime used to uh, claim for itself, as per the PSLM surveys, I believe, of 2004 or 5. Uh, and they claim that up to 10 percent of, uh, the, 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 there's been up to 10 percent reduction in poverty. I'm sure you remember that time uh, when those claims are being debated over here. Um, so. Uh, uh, have we seen anything since then, between then and now, to help us rethink our relationship between growth and poverty? Uh, for example, the PPP government pursued a very different kind of, or a slightly different kind of a growth model. We can debate how different it actually was. And uh, the authority, no less than Hafiz Sheikh himself, uh, just recently, uh, said that during their period, there was less growth, but more job creation, because there was a overall shift in the drivers of growth away from urban towards rural areas, the rural economy. Um, <clears throat> but have we seen anything different from the 2000s till now and how growth is being pursued that might cause us to rethink our relation, how we have or how you've uh, uh, come to see the relationship between growth and poverty? Uh, let me, for a, uh, let me uh, um, agree with uh, Akbar in some ways. The relationship between poverty reduction and inequality is a very strong one, as I indicated to you, quoting the elasticity coefficients. A 1% uh, change in uh, inequality leading a reduction in inequality leading to a 4.7% decline in poverty. This is this is critical. And when you're talking about uh, the Musharraf era, um, my uh, my colleague here, Mifta, has pointed it out to you. If you look at just one ratio, again, I'm going to give you statistics to, co to quote what I, I'm about to say to you. I am going to look at the Palma ratio, which basically gives the share ratio of the top 20% to the bottom 20% in the, in the population. And look at what has happened. This is a very good indicator, some ways, a very re revealing indicator of inequality. During the period 1990-91 to almost 96-97, we see a decline in this ratio, which basically means an improvement in the level of inequality. 2000 onwards, we see a rapid increase in inequality. This, this, this is something that I, it is very clear and the numbers reveal it. Uh, this is nothing coming out of, you know, coming thin air. Up till 2007-8, which in some ways this ratio maximizes, reaches its peak, and thereby we see a, again a decline. So this very theory about uh, which Mifta was saying that we have seen in periods when there is military dictatorship, we have seen an increase in inequality is substantiated by the numbers. Very simple ratio, the Palma ratio, very clearly show, demonstrates this to you. So the, basically what I'm trying to say to you is that this whole theory of accumulation of wealth which leads to a rapid increases in inequality does have an impact on poverty, but a very mild one. The ratio is very small. One uh, percent change leading to a 1.13 percent reduction. So what I am saying is that if growth is pursued in a different strategy, 
um, in a more inclusive manner, which focuses more on the small medium enterprises, which uh, focuses more on agriculture, the kind of stuff which uh, Mifta was also saying, uh, this better distribution of the fiscal policy, more distributive fiscal policy, better access to credit, more <clears throat> inclusive monetary policy, better exchange rate policy. All of this can lead to more reduction in equality and can thereby be better for poverty reducing at the end of the day. So this Dr. is something we would all agree. But Dr. Asha, we would all agree, I'm sure, with, the, with this point that it is if possible to retool the growth process such <clears throat> that its drivers lie uh, among the poor and among uh, those classes who need <clears throat> the benefits the more. My question is, why does that not happen? Why do we keep struggling and why do successive governments come in and uh, revert back to a growth model that resembles very much the kind of fun uh, the, the growth model of the 60s, perhaps, uh, which was all elite driven, big capital uh, driven, sought the accumulation of capital at the top justified itself in the fancy language of functional inequality, as Rasmus reminded us. Uh, what is the difficulty? I mean, is it does at some point economic policy end up being tied in with questions of legitimacy that Pakistan's polity is always uh, struggling with? Are successive regimes trying to buy legitimacy for themselves by building a symbiotic relationship with the elites? Can I? Yeah, this is my uh, the point that I was making and trying to link it with uh, with with the kind of a regime we had, democratic versus um, dictatorial regime is exactly this. See, they need legitimacy. They need to keep people happy, at least people with loud voices happy. And who are the people with loud voices? They are the elite. They're not the people belonging to the lower classes. And what are the factors which are aggravating uh, inequality in the system? It's land ownership, it's credit, access to credit, it's uh, access to uh, real estate, and it's access to tech, tax exemptions. Who are the people who are getting this? They are the elite. So very clearly we do see elite capture being facilitated just to legit legitimize. And uh, I think this is part of the reason why we, we um, you know, though I don't uh, say myself to be as the political economist, which of the caliber Akbar, I'm sure Akbar is going to, uh, to agree with this point. To get legitimacy, they've had to get partners. And uh, how do they get partners? They buy loyalties. Elite capture, let's share. You scratch my back, I scratch your back has been the policy making mode for most of our history. And this is the reason why our growth has not been sustainable and not been so broad based. I uh, strongly okay. feel this. Okay, thanks very much. Akbar, I'm going to throw this to you. We are now squarely on your turf, as a matter of fact, on, uh, on political so, economy. Okay. But why is the failure on the part of successive regimes to be able to not just imagine and talk about, but to actually bring about uh, the kind of policy shift that Mr. pointed towards, uh, that shifts the drivers of growth towards the poor and towards uh, small and medium enterprises. The benefits can come from there and percolate up rather than accumulate at the top and trickle down. Yeah, yeah so there are, there are two points here. One is that uh, I, do, I don't think it is just non-democratic military regimes which try to buy people out. I think it's civilian elected governments who do which perhaps do a better job actually. Uh, because uh, you know we see that today, we see that see that see that every day and we see that in every government. So the system of governance of economic uh, rent seeking of a capitalist economy that we have is not surprising. And if you want to make it participatory or not, you always have lobbies, you always have people, you always need I think the military is as uh, military governments are as political as non-military governments in Pakistan. So I think there's no, there's very, it's different groups. So that's the first thing. The second is, I think, I mean, I, 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 I want to take a different angle to something that none of us has mentioned, but Mifta mentioned in passing. The, the greatest uh, creator of inequality in the short term is inflation and food inflation. You know, forget about structured reform. I think it's fantastic. Let's have land reform. Let's have better taxation. Let's have more rights for workers and things like that. All very good. Let's work on that. But the, the, today, over this last uh, 24 months, 
I think that the, the greatest creator of inequality and poverty both at the same time is inflation and food inflation. It's about 12 or 13 percent at the moment. It's been 17 percent last year. Fortunately, it's come down because uh, there's no economic activity. When act and despite the fact there's no economic activity, our inflation is about 12 percent or 9 percent, whatever it is. So it's phenomenal. And 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 over a two-year period, we've created inequality of an extraordinary amount. Just simply forget about jobs, corona, anything else, just by not managing in, uh, inflation. I think we need to talk about this because these, you know, we can talk about elite and elites and capture. And I think uh, Asim is, uh, has, has two books on that. So uh, he, perhaps he would like to uh, jump in at that stage. But I think that, you know, it's, we often forget something as simple as the price of food. That's the greatest in, uh, inequality creator over, and it's been a long term. Two years is not a short time. So I, I, I think it's important that we bring our conversation around that issue as well. Okay, <clears throat> we'll, we'll bring it there in a moment. But since you mentioned Asim already has two books, I'd like to hear his thoughts on uh, w w what he's been hearing us talk about for the past few minutes. Asim? Yeah, look, I think that, uh, you know, you use the word, Khuram, why have successive governments failed? I don't think they've failed. They've succeeded. Uh, because they've succeeded in the goals that, you know, all of us are more or less saying they've set out for themselves, which is to consolidate um, powerful dominant interests. And I think that this distinction between, you know, military regimes and democratic regimes, while on the one hand, I think none of us here will, 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 uh, will, will um, sort of disagree. The, the, the fundamental question of, of democracy remains on its, in its own right. Uh, an important one to defend. But, but I think even under elected regimes, and this, this present regime is a classic example, you know, as far as elite capture is concerned, the military's economic interests are always institutionalized. They're institutionalized in the form of its, its corporate entities. They're institutionalized in the form of its budgets. That's one big interest group. Then there's big industry, big real estate moguls like Malik Riaz. No one's ever going to antagonize the Malik Riaz. And then I think that there's a third level of, of, um, of this story, which is, which is a political story, which is a story of commitment. Who are you committed to? Who, who's, who's wealth and who's, who are you trying to help grow? And that's a global story. Let's not forget that inequality has grown around the world. I mean, and this is like, this is, this is what's talked about in, in, in political economy globally now, whether it's Piketty or what have you. You know, the, the, there's a steady increase in inequality all over the world. And all of this reflects everywhere clear, distinct political choices about the kind of um, economy that you want, which is an economy that is essentially controlled by big interests um, and in which at best, you know, to use the Ayub language, all you are, all you are saying is uh, to, to, to the working people of your society is, well, maybe some of this will trickle down to you. Um, and, I, and I want to add something else here, which is, you know, when we're talking about assets and, and land reform, so on and so forth. I think there's also questions of, of just basic, um, you know, we're talking, Akbar said inflation and food and, and basic prices. Things like uh, in our cities, which is an increasingly large agglomeration of working poor, um, you'll see, for instance, under all regimes, um, whether they be elected or, or unelected, um, for instance, we have large numbers of people who build their own homes in the form of kachiyabadis. They create their own assets, they invest in their own homes, and every regime comes and says, okay, Malik Riaz or Beria Enclave wants this land, let's, let's demolish it. So there's also an idea, an imaginary of growth and development where you're selling to sort of an upwardly mobile consumer, sort of let's say a mythical middle class, and that's, I think, what, what this is. This is a political vision. It's an economic vision. And pretty much across the board, successive regimes are buying into this. And, and I think this is a global story. And I think that's also important to bear in mind because we, we don't want to end up in, uh, which we tend to do, in, in a sort of story of Pakistani exceptionalism. And, and, and that, that's, that's why you see the kinds of sort of populist responses uh, to an inequality even around the world, again, as you do in Pakistan, because there's a large number of people who are quite deliberately, as I say, not failure, but quite deliberately left out. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. you kicked this whole discussion off by uh, bringing up the fact that successive uh, finance ministers, are in fact, two, and prime ministers, too, are too caught up in firefighting. 
to really devote too much time, attention, or bandwidth, perhaps to uh, policy bandwidth, to uh, questions of you know how to change the endowment, uh, material endowments of the underlying social order. Uh, but aside from their will, uh, how much? Uh, how, what what is the capacity of the state to be able to do this in the face of you know? Uh, Asim mentioned housing and Kachi Abadi as the, uh, perhaps the only way for the working poor to be able to build housing for themselves and to own assets for themselves. And those assets, they have a very weak claim on them because they can be destroyed at any time. And we've seen untold examples of that in the past. Uh, you know, uh, Kachi Abadi is being destroyed to make room for uh, elite housing society. But the overall endowment of rights, the overall endowment, uh, you know, protection of property rights, the uh, uh, access to the financial system, to, to long-term financing, uh, or even to government subsidies, the machinery for the distribution of government subsidies, uh, the, uh, the fact that many uh, business enterprises that the working poor can set up must be set up basically as rackets in the informal sector and therefore remain inaccessible or are beyond the reach of the state's own policy apparatus. How do you see the limitations uh, of the state in itself, even if it wanted to bring about a more robust, uh, you know, engagement with poverty and inequality related issues in this country? Well, I think, I think th that has to be tested. The state has never wanted to actually address these things. So I don't know how capable the state would be if it actually really wanted to. I'll just tell you that as, as finance ministers and prime ministers, you know, that 90% of the people that you meet are really rich people, you know, actually 90 is, is a smaller number, 99%, I should say, are people, you know, you, you meet the large industrialists, you meet the chambers of commerce, you meet things like that. You never meet the poor people near the budget time. You know, one time you meet maybe the, you know, like once or twice you meet the farmers association, Kisan Etihad's, you know, president or whatnot. And, and, and so so the people who are lobbying are actively very rich people. Then, you know, we, the, we are not a very creative nation. In the 1960s, we started this policy of import substitution, of protecting uh, infant industry. There's not a single industry uh, whose protection has been taken away in the last 40 years. Uh, so these infant industry protections still exist. Uh, look at how much money the government spends on helping the farmers whether it's seed development, nothing. I mean, in, in actually, literally nothing, you know. Uh, we, we, I mean, our cotton crop has been falling uh, year after year, and yet uh, there's been actually no research at all. Not only is there no research, we've actually not even spent a few million dollars, 20, 25, 30 million dollars in, in, in acquiring technology from, from companies like Monsanto or, you know, like to get these uh, uh, seeds. Our farmers are 20, 30 percent less productive than Indian farmers or Chinese farmers, even less than that. There is no way they can compete. I mean, if you are producing less uh, per acre compared to India and all that, and other goods are like uh, pesticides, et cetera, et cetera, are tradable, uh, how can you compete? You know, the one subsidy that we give to farmers uh, is for fertilizer. But if you look at the impact, the subsidy actually only goes to the fertilizer companies, not really to the farmers. Uh, I, and and, and I, I, I'll tell you a little story, I think that, that and, and then and I'll again come back to this. When I was in jail uh, recently, uh, uh, I, I read a book called uh, Poor Economics by Abhijit Banerjee and uh, yeah. I think Christine yeah. Doflo, uh, both of whom actually eventually won the Nobel Prize, of how poor people make economic decisions which are fundamentally different than what we think of uh, economic decisions, rational economic decisions made by, you know, uh, made in the economic textbooks. At the same time, there was a guard in my uh, prison um, whose, whose father owned six acres of land near Faisalabad. And that year, uh, they did not plant anything. Okay. Uh, and he, one of the, his biggest worry was that his father had gotten a 28,000 rupee electricity bill. Uh, and, and so family had no resources, so they did not plant anything uh, on the six acres of land. Now, that was an irrational economic decision that here is six acres, you can put in, you know, maybe 10,000 rupees or 15,000 rupees worth of inputs and get something out of it. But they did not do it uh, because there were serious budget constraints. Uh, so what actually it happened is that, you know, and, and this is to uh, Akbar Saab's point that 
we've actually rendered the poor so poor that they did not even have small monies to actually do small farming. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, production of perishable vegetables and farm products has gone down. And that's one of the reasons food inflation, especially rural food inflation, which is 14 percent, has gone up. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, this this whole system is set up that, you know, I mean, uh, the, the, you know, we, we, we when this government came in, for instance, the price of fertilizers went up, the price of other things went up. And these poor, poor, poor people did not have enough money to do small plants, uh, you know, plantings. And, and hence we had, you know, uh, a reduction in uh, food production, you know, across the board, small, small reductions in food production. Uh, because of the inelasticity, the small reduction in food production increased uh, the prices a lot. Uh, but but this uh, it, it, the, the, the issue is not just this government. Really, we've never addressed uh, what to do with 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 the poorest people and what to do, how to bring the rest of the society in. Our policymakers, we really think of 10, 20 percent of the Pakistanis, you know, who read newspapers, Urdu or English newspapers. And, 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 and mostly urban uh, the people. And, and, and we don't really go beyond this. This is the people that the government interacts with, whether you're bureau, bureaucrats or politicians. Uh, and, and even when we have, for instance, uh, rural politicians, uh, you know, uh, agriculturists, uh, their priorities are also very different because they actually also are very rich. They also have a house in Lahore or a house in Karachi. And the children live in Lahore or Karachi. Uh, they just own farms and they just go for elections in, in the rural areas. Uh, so, so, yeah. so yeah. Th there is never a, a, there is never a policy to address these issues that we're talking about here. Doctor Aisha, to what extent <clears throat> would you say that failure, perhaps? I'm not sure whether you even agree that there is a failure here, but in the event that you do agree, uh, to what extent is that also a function of the lack of tools available to the state, given the vast uh, undocumented uh, activity and, and populations um, uh, in this country? Does the state have the right tools and can it, does it have the means with which to develop the right tools with which to uh, uh, so bring about a meaningful uh, change in its economic focus towards addressing poverty and inequality? Um, I think the problem um, has been the, the policy. The problem has been the lack of priority to these things. Because if the government puts its mind to getting it done, it can organize itself. See, we've spent so many years, our monetary policy, our fiscal policy, our bureaucracy, our state institutions, have been put and designed to achieve what we have been trying to achieve for so many years, which is, you know, the kind of growth that we are suddenly we are seeing, uh, we are experiencing, and so on and so forth. So my uh, my response to you is that if we put our minds and heart to it, we can find the mechanisms to do it. It's just that we really haven't had, we have not prioritized it. For us, this has not been inclusive growth has not been on the agenda. Taking care of these stuff, formalizing the informal sector, giving adequate uh, attention to the smaller, uh, the, the agricultural sector, particularly farmer, giving attention to SMEs, for example, look, look, uh, we were talking about how the response to COVID was taken, you know, was so pro rich. Why could they have not designed a policy which was catering to the SMEs? The state bank could have if it wanted to. So my, my, my uh, response to that is that I think it's the lack of policy direction priority and not so much the tools because one quick follow-up in that case Dr. Asha, what would an economic model of the sort that you would like to see look like how different would it be uh, what, what would some of its sort of broader features be uh, if uh, it was designed as primarily to serve uh, the interests of the poor and the working poor and not the interests of, uh, of of big dominant uh, 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 groups. Uh, would some of the uh, items of, on the agenda today, for example, documentation of the economy, broadening of the tax base, 
would these remain and would these still need to be pursued and uh, what would be some new elements that would that we would see coming in uh, yes actually this is this is i think a good question in the sense that i think covid the way the economy has been really uh, been disturbed and everything i think the revival of uh, should really focus on making it more inclusive and i would tell you what i would be focusing on or some of the new things that we would like to see put on the list of priority which has not been there in the way it should have been first of all we have to somehow focus on more labor intensive areas i would like to put agriculture top on there for some reason for decades agriculture hasn't got the kind of a policy attention that it deserves even though our uh, manufacturing a lot of it is agro based we need to put agriculture up there one second we need to focus on smes we have done enough for the corporate large corporate sector they take care of their needs themselves and they have voices loud enough to be heard in all the policy quarters what we now need are some people really focusing on small and medium enterprises small and small and medium enterprises second third i would like to see direct taxes focusing more on uh, taxes being more direct taxes real estate income taxes capital gains being taxed fourth i would like the expenditure policy to really really focus on projects particularly in the short run which will be uh, more labor intensive with quick gestation period so that they can you know return back to the system quickly small projects like you know improving lining of agricultural systems and so on and so forth um, small market roads and so on and so forth and develop uh, protection of social development expenditure very important the, we need to see an improvement in social development expending and some improvement in social protection this is very important i would also like to see target right we have at this point of time in fact recently i see a report done by um, uh, um, bakar masood on subsidies he was pointing out that you know bulk of the subsidies are not really going to the right target group exporters we need to we need to really protect at this point of time because in some ways we need dollars so without really doing anything harmful for the exporting sector we need to properly target our subsidies also so i would i would like to really see this post covid a revival of the economy to be more inclusive in nature and i think this let's convert it into an opportunity and uh, we have this government which calls itself the riyasat medina whatever they say let them uh, let, they should really well, with all that rhetoric that comes with it let them do something because at this point of time we see them totally failing more so than the previous governments if i can add because the mafias in our uh, are totally in operation these days oh, okay. and we need to see something coming out of this a um, very different focus okay. and uh, you know these were some things i would like to say dr asha you know if there was a if there was a representative from the government on this panel they would probably in all likelihood disagree and uh, they would have their own uh, uh, point to make on that but uh, without sort of taking this into uh, in, into the politics uh, if i can just take what you have said uh, to our other two guests um, who are in fact uh, who are political economists uh, so akbar sir how are you seeing the state's capacity to be able to uh, deal with questions of inequality and poverty and uh, is it uh, to what extent is it just a failure of imagination that we are dealing with here to be no to, to not yeah. be able to bring about a model of inclusive growth and what might a model of inclusive growth look like for you i think this is the uh, probably the only discussion on the economy which i've had for we've been going for about 40 minutes without anybody mentioning the imf so i think it's good to throw them in as well because somehow they do they're always around and you know whatever and and the reasons why the imf exists and i i i i've argued as well that we don't hold the imf responsible the imf is a solution 
uh, for the problems and the way the elite want to address certain things which they are unable to do. But you know, all the the wish list. I mean, I completely agree with I Aisha mostly. Okay, let's have more social spending. Let's have more inclusive growth. Let's have more pro poor policies. All very well. But when you have a fiscal deficit of eight point six percent, when your defense spending is going up, when their exports are have not budged in the last uh, i think 7 years or we stuck at 24 20 between 23 and 25 billion bangladesh is now up to 37 billion and they going uh, faster and uh, when your growth rate was 0 minus 0.5% i mean keeping all that in front of you um we, we, the wish list is unimportant i mean like, what would one like to do certainly there's no no denying the fact that unless you have far greater representation of um of taxation far more you know a, a huge uh, sort of increase in the number of people who are paying their income tax if the guy sitting in bani gala pays a few hundred thousand rupees and talks about taxation you know i am not going to i i can't avoid not paying taxes but you know that's that's a role model which we don't others others want others to follow so when you have such clear signals of people who are put in place to make public policy regarding economics whose own tax returns uh, are are minimal uh, so you you can't talk about social spending you have to go and end up borrowing so i uh, felt that the main problem with pakistan's economy continues to be a low tax base not not low in terms of collection but low in terms of its outreach whether they are urban traders whether they are the real estate i mean no one can disagree with the the the, the actor which aisha has mentioned so you have to start getting them how do you go around them you have a political economy constraint even the military and the musharraf was not able to go around and collect uh, service taxes and taxes from the service sector because they closed down if a musharraf can't do it a nawaz and imran can't do it either so there are these political economy constraints which exist but we have to we live with constraints we have to optimize whatever problems of uh, the solutions that exist within constraints so one way to do is is not to increase the general sales tax there is not to give a subsidy to exports i don't think that really helps us but to increase to go after a group of people or a set of people urban taxes i think people have started talking a great deal about the urban property tax and i remember uh, hafiz pasha and aisha writing about this 30 years ago that urban property tax at a time when uh, uh, the urban sector was not as developed as it Uh, as it is today today i mean malik riaz onwards the subsidies that he gets the political economy uh, vested interest relationship that he creates uh, there's a huge tax hole being created there so let's start plugging them let's see which government has you know the ability to do that so i think before we get to a wish list we have to address the problems where they exist i all of us would like an equitable just society but you know let's let's talk about where we are at the moment Okay, where we are at the moment, Asim, I'd like to ask you: How do you see these hard binding constraints? Does inclusion come at a cost? I mean, can uh, can we really bring about inclusion for the working poor without also including them in the tax net, without also asking them to bear uh, carry their fair share of the tax burden? Uh, we do complain that the elites take a disproportionate share of the state's uh, resources uh, in the name of promoting growth. uh but the uh, point of view of the elites as well we pay a disproportionate share of the taxes that keeps the state of float as well um so how do you see these hard binding constraints within which the state has to operate and uh, what sort of a model of an inclusive economy uh, do you think is possible within that yeah i'm not I'm not sure which elite you're talking about that is bearing such a heavy burden of the, of the taxes but i mean okay in any the manufacturing case, elite specifically okay Sure. All right. Fair enough. I mean, I think. Look, I think that the, that 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 working people um, are are have a huge tax burden, irrespective, right? Because it's just um, tagged onto everything they buy. Uh, in any case, um, it's tagged onto their utility bills. It's it's. So I mean, I think that there is enough information out there to suggest. You know, everybody here is talking about sort of directly taxing income. um and and i think that this question of urban property i mean i i would like to call it urban land reform right once upon a time there was a very uh, well known slogan and and it wasn't just a slogan it was a, it was a definitive economic at the same time that 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 period which our prime minister was talking about as being an anomaly or being some kind of bad uh, memory um uh, was was a period when where you could talk about land reform and i think urban land reform is is a big 
um, part of the story now or must be um, moving forward. And I think that will address um, a lot of the inequalities that are, are, are growing at breakneck speed. Not a lot, but at a, some significant number. I want to draw everyone's attention to, to something else here also. Though. You know, you mentioned something earlier about capacity. Um, you know, India is a, a pretty unequal country. It suffers from more or less the same kinds of elite capture and, 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 and uh, dominant interest uh, groups uh, and, and, and rent-seeking that we, we find. But India, you know, now some years ago, actually, well over a decade ago, made a massive, huge investment in documenting the unorganized sector. It was a national commission on the unorganized sector. They, they put in lots of money. They put in lots of research funding. And for what it's worth, I mean, India still bulldozes its Ririwalas and its Kachiyabadis and its ghats and its villages like we do. Um, but there is something about intellectual sort of capacity more generally that informs more potentially uh, more pro-poor economic policy. One of the big problems that we suffer from in this country is intellectually we don't debate stuff. We don't really have much in the way. You could probably count on two hands the number of people who talk about the kinds of issues that we're talking about. Um, and the, the space that exists within, for instance, the academy, which is where I'm based, um, more generally questions of how policy debates are framed, you know, what kind of imagination we are allowed to have. I mean, I think that's a big part of the story in Pakistan, putting in not just money and funding into sort of maybe doing surveys of unorganized sectors or, or undocumented parts of the economy, and thereby, sure, bringing in, you know, smaller medium enterprises, bringing in the so-called poor into the tax net too, I mean, in the long run. But more generally in expanding the kinds of discussions we have around our economy and, and recognizing that these are not technical matters. Too much of our time, I think, I feel, is spent, especially in the popular media, as if there are some sort of perfect technical solutions. And if we just adopted those, that's why we have sort of this, with all due respect to everybody in this panel, we have this sort of um, fetish of, of what are called technocrats in this country, which, by the way, happens generally when, when military regimes, of course, come into power, as if like the economy is a technical matter. And if we just adopt all the textbook solutions, we'll, we'll and as, that's why I mentioned earlier that these are global problems that, that, that the world is facing. And we need um, intellectual imagination and breadth uh, and debate and discussion, including discussion about political will um, and so on. So I think that that's, that's a big part of the story too, at least a significant part of the story moving forward, because there aren't, as, as Akbar is saying, there aren't immediate, probably magic wand solutions. There is one more thing I would like to bring to your attention, which is also a contemporary debate globally, which is the UBI. We live under a capitalist world. We want the poor to be able to, to go out and purchase food or maybe find some shelter over their heads, be able to survive in, in what everybody's acknowledging is a ruthless world. So the UBI is something that we've not debated in Pakistan. It's called the Unconditional Basic Income. Um, and, you know, sort of we have SAS and BISP. These are very, very sort of basic forms of, of cash transfer. The UBI is something which unconditional or universal. I think there are debates to be had around. These, these are the kinds of debates that I think at least we could initiate that give us a chance of both thinking about longer term structural reforms to address the, the inequities in, in, in political and economic resources, political power, and who makes policy. Right. But then also, in the meantime, right. perhaps take on ameliorative measures that can allow the poor uh, some kind of, kind of respite. Right, great. Now, Mr. we've come back full circle to the point that you actually raised, uh, which uh, went all the way around about the lack of imagination. But uh, if I were to give you the space and say, okay, what are the recommendations you would have uh, for any government that's dealing with a challenge such as COVID, that's dealing with the challenge of uh, a sharply contracting economy that needs to adjust in order to tackle its deficits, uh, deficits, incidentally, that your government left behind for the for the current dispensation, uh, and and do so in a manner that is inclusive. Uh, what uh, what what sort of recommendations does your imagination that come up with? Give you, you the space to have such an imaginative input into the policy conversation. Your cam your mic is on mute, Mr. Sorry, there you go. Sorry. 
uh, I mean, uh, just as an aside, I was talking to some people in the political in our political party, and I was telling them that you know maybe next time around I'd like to be the minister for food security or agriculture because I think that the biggest gains to be had, economic gains to be had in in Pakistan are actually by having the right policy uh, parameters there. Uh, I'll go back to what I said earlier that you know there is there is no trade off in Pakistan. It is such an unequal society that actually if you increase equity, you will actually increase economic efficiency by spending very little money. You know you get the most bang for a buck uh, on agriculture. You know just if you make there is no way we can grow. This country will not grow unless you increase agriculture productivity, and and and, and that actually solves a lot of your you know poverty mitigation, inequity uh, reduction issues. Uh, just by increasing agriculture income and, and just by increasing uh, you know productivity in the agriculture sector this is i think the number one this should be the number one focus of our government not all the stuff that we do uh, to help exporters and all of that stuff which is fine you know i mean you know let elite have their pound of flesh uh, but but spend very little money i mean a tenth of the money that we spend on on the elites on just the agriculture reforms and you know uh, increasing the agriculture productivity and that really will g give this country enough of a reserve that we can then you know invest in in manufacturing and other th other, other things like that that's that's the first point uh second i and i want to disagree uh, i think with uh, akbar here uh, that i think that there is very little to be had by going after more urban middle classes and other rich people uh, in terms of taxation uh, that most of the rich people have some sort of a documentation going on regime going on that it's very difficult to collect more taxes i've run some you know regressions and all that when i was a finance minister and, and even before that uh, uh, there is very little uh, revenue that we can get out of this and most people are somehow um, you know, somehow have covered their uh, covered their tails, if you for lack of a better expression, uh, especially the rich people. Uh, so the only people you can go after are like you know middle class salaried people, and and, and I don't know why we we do this actually. Uh, so so there, I think I think that most of the increase in taxes taxation will come from an increase in growth, and let that uh, happen uh, organically. I agree with the property part, tax part of it, that you know we, we don't tax property nearly enough, and we should, and, and that certainly, obviously, also will is a great equalizer across generations. Then, you know, if you're if you're taxing property, uh, which is a provincial subject, uh, uh, but 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 you know the, to have these ridiculous rates of property, which are 10% of the market, just makes no sense. I mean that has to be brought in line, and and that will also help you document this economy. Although, I mean we should try to document the economy, but only where it's when it there is a palpable benefit to it just for the sake of documentation for the sake of documentation without understanding the ramifications i think is 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 not the right thing to do but uh, and now to answer your question what what policies we can design in the short run to help that's a very difficult question uh, so 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 like for instance you know it's easy to give loans to large industrial enterprises and then you have you know, you'll get the loans back and banks are comfortable dealing with this and all that stuff. But it's very difficult to know how much loans to give to a small barber shop in terms of recovering from COVID and all that, because you don't know what is his revenue, you know, because, you know, the guy was not documented and all that stuff, you know, with, same with salons and bakeries and all, all the small businesses. Uh, but that's why the government has left it. But there are ways to do it by square footage of shops, for instance, by you know utility bills and things like that. And yes, there would be some spillages, but so what? There are spillages, uh, spillages and wastages, even when we are subsidizing the most elites and very rich. So I think that that is something that the government should do uh, again if there is a big COVID wave and now if we have to go towards closures and all that stuff. Uh, 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 you know, if if we do this, the government should do this. Uh, but 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 the long term policy, in my prescription at least, is the, the simplistic pres prescription, perhaps. But I think that it is effective. Um, is that we should devote some more uh, uh, energies towards improving our agricultural productivity, which is which which will in the short term give you the biggest gains uh, for growth, but also increase uh, uh, you know equitable distribution of resources in society. Okay, Dr. Aisha, bringing this round to you, uh, that's a pretty heavy menu that uh, MISTA has laid out for us. 
to uh, what extent is it realistic to expect that these things can be done especially under the kind of conditions the government has been operating under uh, they literally had days in which to invent a social or to try and create a social protection mechanism to give you one example a social protection mechanism that actually targets the urban poor the nfer database is actually inadequate for that purpose from what i understand the majority of the people uh, in the in that database are actually in, in rural areas or at least here in sin um there, there were there, there were precious few people in uh, in karachi registered in that database uh but beyond that uh, how do they not give subsidies to the rich in that time period in order to avoid large scale layoffs when you have days in which to uh make things happen so within the hard binding constraints of the present how do they move towards uh, and then beyond that of course uh, dr akbar did the right thing to remind us that there is the imf over here i thought we had actually included the imf in the conversation by talking about the elite consensus um but uh, uh, but on its own terms yes imf is also one of the big hard binding constraints and the demands of macroeconomic adjustment that uh, no government can really escape uh, altogether within these hard binding constraints how far can we go towards imagining our way towards an inclusive growth uh, model actually khuram yes this is this is an important a very important consideration and an important see uh, the thing uh, is that the reality of the imf is on our heads and the fact that um, the the fiscal uh, side and our balance of payment side poses very very operative and binding constraints on our maneuverability is also um, a, a binding constraint but the thing again is of trade offs then what you need to do is then come up with that kind of a design in which under these constraints you can maximize what you need to do i'll give you um, a, a a good uh, you know i'll give you an example see um, you have used your monetary policy to leverage to give some leverage to the to the upper income groups uh, for small and medium enterprises what do we have we have microfinance we have microfinance where lending is takes place at 16 17 14 percent interest rates who's going to avail it so um, that monetary policy can be you know um, interestingly uh, used and uh, the fact that of the matter is that commercial banks are not really uh, being pushed uh, to really cater to this segment of of um, of uh, loaners or potential creditors simply because they have a very easy way of get, getting profits they just get uh, government paper they are under no pressure to really go and do some hard work and find good uh, creditors in uh, in these smes as well so uh, we will have to design those uh, as far as the imf is concerned this is a real big problem the problem is with imf i think at this point of time is that we can neither do without them nor with them given the their frame of mind at this stage where they are focusing on um higher taxation at a time when the economy is in such recession as it is the government is saying minus 4% i think by the end of of it it will be closer to minus 1.5% if not more uh, and uh, this is no time for us to really go in for higher fiscal effort this is not the right time and i'm not sure why this imf uh, is is in in the mood that it is i think some politics are all also has to come into play uh, softening of imf is keeping our fingers crossed we are able to do so so uh, but then um, given this all the more reason for us to design a fiscal policy which will serve our purposes all the more reason for us to uh, um, go in perhaps for a kind of a social contract call me an optimist but i am willing to uh, uh, be called an optimist but this is the time when we really need to convince all the stakeholders that if you want pakistan's economy to be move forward this is the time for us to have a new social contract the elite have to give up a little bit 
be it military establishment, be it the, the, the corporate sector, be it the MNCs, be it the landed gentry. gentry. We, we, we need to just come up with this kind of a social contract. I don't think there is anything that we can do until and unless we sit down around the table and say that, listen, rent seeking will only take place if there are rents to give. At this point of time, given the state of the economy, there are no rents to have. So uh, let's generate that kind of a momentum where we can then later on go ahead and extract our share of rents from the system. This is the time when system, the, the economy has to be jacked up, taken up, and we all have to put in our bit in this. But rents is what you and I call it, Dr. Aisha, <clears throat> among us. Those on the receiving end don't call it rents, right? They call it profits. They call it uh, uh, basic cash flows, you know, something that they need in order to survive and to be able to continue their operations and provide the jobs that they do provide. But in any case, I mean, if I'm just listening to the two of you, if I may just challenge both of you at the same time here, uh, Dr. Aisha and Mr. that uh, uh, both of you belong to the same political party. And that same political party is not known in its manifestos to be saying the sort of things that you are saying right now. Uh, in its manifestos and in its uh, stints in power, that party, the PMNN, has in fact uh, uh, emphasized and prioritized large scale infrastructure spending and dedication of government resources towards building roads, highways, bridges, and airports. Um, and that, that as its model for growth. Uh, so, am I right in understanding that you both are now uh, would, would offer some advice to your own party that they need to rethink? how they approach growth. And I throw the question to both of you. I'm not sure uh, which one of you wishes to take this up first. I will take the, the easier route. As Finance Minister Punjab, we did a lot. So let I leave that answer to Mifta because I think what we did in Punjab, we were... We were um, uh, uh, no, you do the call the orange no train uh, a bad um, investment, but I, if from my own perspective, despite my disagreements at that stage, I think nonetheless it is it, uh, whatever is pro poor is is good enough for me. I think I leave that to Mifta now. Mifta, would you be willing to advise your government now to change its uh, thinking and its approach, or its party, sorry, to, towards uh, that, that whenever it does come into government next, uh, that it should change its approach towards how to uh, use public resources? No, no, no. I, I, I don't want to absolve myself at all from, from, from this. I've been part of the policy making of the party for many years. I've, I mean, I've you know, in both the 2013 manifesto and the 2018 manifesto, I was one of the, you know, authors of that, uh, the economic part, the energy part and all that. So, I, you know, if, if, if our party is, has had any shortcomings and many shortcomings, I, I'm fully part of that, uh, part of that uh, uh, cabal of <laughs> elites, you know. Uh, but so, so I don't wish to absolve myself of that. Number one. Number two. Uh, look, this infrastructure spending, whether it's, it's spending on, on bus routes and things like that, or hospitals, and, and, and in Punjab, for instance, you know, uh, building BHUs and, and district hospitals and, 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 and division hospitals and, 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 and making I ICUs and all that, that is actually a pro-poor spending because that, that is done for, for the poor people. Even, even you know, you, you can talk about this, you know, uh, the, the laptop program is maybe efficient or not, but that's also, you know, in, uh, discriminatorily, uh, just, you know, giving, giving away uh, to, to everybody, including middle class, lower middle class. Punjab also had, for instance, PEF and PEEF programs, uh, uh, um, uh, which was endowment funds, uh, you know, uh, and, and also I think they used to give 400 rupees per, uh, per child uh, if they want to go to private school and not to government school. So I think the Punjab government actually did do a, a lot of things. Uh, and, and it is the provincial governments that do that. Um, I think, I think, uh, if, if anything, I think at the federal level, perhaps we did not do such a good enough job. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, uh, in terms of orienting the policy towards uh, towards the poor. Uh, and, and my issue is, you know, with the FBR, for instance, that because they want to collect revenues, they have all all these protections for the very rich people. You know, uh, for custom duties and all that, that increases the price of everything. But uh, but again, you know, my my fundamental thing is not to, sort of to have this to, this war uh, between you know classes, middle classes, and rich and poor. But but to actually because there are gains to be had by you know uh, 
by uh, if, in terms of both equity and efficiency, you can improve both. For instance, by investing more in agriculture productivity uh, uh, and, and things like that. But look at look at all the subsidies that we give. For instance, you know the subsidies that we give uh, on sugar is always premised on the fact that we want to help out the sugar cane farmers. But everybody on this panel knows that, that in the end, it's never the sugar cane farmers that are helped. Okay, the subsidy, yeah. the cotton. For instance, the cotton uh, textile cotton policy, agriculture policy, actually used to reside in the textile ministry. Okay, and it was our government that actually took it away from the textile ministry and gave it to the food security ministry. And, and as long as the cotton, you know, policy was in the textile ministry, you know what who was being helped with that. Uh, so similarly, you know, hmm. the, every single every single subsidy that we give, I mean, the fertilizer subsidy I've already mentioned, you know, essentially is actually just helping out. Uh, the, the, the the very uh, you know the richest uh, companies you know uh, the fertilizer companies and not uh, directly the farmers so so, so the, even the subsidy regime that we have uh, you know presumably to help the farmers actually doesn't help uh, the poor it really helps the richest people so I I mean the federal government has been less than creative right. but I think the Punjab I think has done its its job I I think more or less. Can I add, okay, Punjab uh, uh, did a fine job. That's the reason I didn't answer the question. I think we were, our expenditures were very poor, poor. Um, um, uh, it was at the federal level where there was a problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I mean, in that case, where, you know, we've been talking about how there's a large scale failure to imagine inclusive growth and bring it about in this country. But now you want to, uh, uh, you put it on the record that in fact, uh, for five years, at least uh, one, the, the country's largest provincial government was undertaking a, a model for uh, inclusive growth and uh, does not really need to reimagine anything and uh, and retool anything beyond that model. No, no, I I, I didn't mean to, uh, to be so arrogant. What I was saying is that see inherently the way provincial uh, the allocate functions are distributed between different tiers of government. Provincial governments are responsible for education, health public transport, agriculture, small, medium enterprises, uh, um, irrigation, and so on. Many of these are inherently pro-poor expenditures because the way it is designed, these are really consumed by pro people with the in the lower in income segment the upper classes have their own education system their own health and so on and so forth so inherently provincial expenditures are pro poor that is the, the way things are designed in in pakistan uh, this is the way functional allocations are made so that is the reason are uh, the if there are higher public expenditures at the provincial level they are likely to benefit the poorer segments of the population more so that is the way it is. So, but we can make it more uh, pro poor by focusing more on agriculture. We tried to do that later on. Initially, in the first two years, the focus was more on energy side because we thought there was a big deficiency, which was leading to major decline in the potential growth rate of the country that had to be addressed. We, the focus was there. And thereafter, there was a lot of focus on agriculture there was focus on education there was focus on okay. health so uh, so uh, not that it was <clears throat> ideal but i think broadly speaking the priorities were right we didn't do enough okay. we could have done better let's, but we were not so way off let, let's let's take us forward to uh to to, to dr akbar here uh so you, at some level you've got to feel for the present government the one that's in power right now they came into power uh, and they had to undertake a very, very steep and uh, painful economic adjustment to, uh, on an almost emergency basis, uh, uh, you know, bridge the external deficits, start uh, reversing the slide in the foreign exchange reserves, and uh, and tackle a runaway fiscal deficit. Uh, and just as soon as they were beginning to get a handle on that, we found ourselves in uh, in, in COVID, and they had days in which to literally devise a working economic model in the face of large-scale lockdowns and enforcement of social distancing. And we can talk about how well they actually manage these, and this I'll come to you in a moment. But we can talk about, to be fair here, we can talk about how well they actually manage these, but the fact that they had to manage these situations uh, certainly imposed very, very hard binding constraints on them. How much space did they really have to uh, think about, to, uh, to debate out, and to bring about 
uh, an inclusive uh, model of an inclusive economy. You're right about the painful economic adjustment because we are all suffering. There's no question about that. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't uh, want to give uh, credit to COVID. I think that's the, the escape clause that the government has. And I looked at uh, economic history, past governments. There have been some very bad ones, but one never as bad as this in terms of their ability, vision, understanding, and outcomes of what they've done to the economy. I think uh, when things are put to rest, we will look back and say that we have never had such a poor uh, management of the economy under any government. In fact, they, they stand out alone. So I think it's, a, it's forget about constraints. I think it's about an understanding. I mean, first of all, be, once you begin to look, understand what the problems are, and then uh, you start looking at the constraints that once you know that, okay, these are the problems, these are the constraints, how do we move forward? I don't see any understanding in any uh, senior minister in this government, including uh, the prime minister. I mean, this, uh, this idea, which, which uh, Asim mentioned earlier, which the prime minister sort of floated that we are going to, it's all about creating wealth. It's not about growth. Even I, I, I'd even accept growth. But when you say we're, all, we're going to create wealth, it's very different from cre creating wealth, uh, growth. You can create wealth very easily. Let's give me some money and I'm, I'm wealthy. You've created get wealth. You can, you can transfer some public sector resources to the private sector. That's creating wealth. That's not creating jobs. That's not creating growth. So, I mean, it's just how the people in power today understand Pakistan's economy and how little they understand about the economy, which I think is the key problem. It's not, I mean, these governments, I mean, I, I, Mifta and Aisha have been in government and they're, it's probably likelier to be in government sooner than Asim and I will ever be in government. Uh, so, I mean, they, they'll still be, they still have an idea of how to go about things because they've learned. And I'm, I'm very surprised, as you also pointed out, that the Nawaz Sharif PMLN is now talking about the agriculture sector, something that they haven't spoken about a lot. And I'm glad that there's this understanding. So at least there's that room taking place. Look at, again, I'll go back to a single point agenda of food inflation. I think, you know, we talk about poverty, we talk about inequality, we talk about ability. Just food inflation today in Pakistan is, and the way it's been mismanaged, whether it's the price of wheat, the price of uh, sugar, the price of basic raw materials. I mean, we're very happy that current account deficit has been positive for the last three months. But what's happening to uh, inequality, what's happening to the poor, and what's happening to prices is something that is completely ignored. So I'm not even going to go further and talk about long-term scenarios. I'm just saying, fix this, and that's, you know, you're halfway there. But I'm asking you to, uh, to, to, to focus your mind on how to fix this in the immediate term. I'm not even saying long-term. I'm saying within the constraints of the past two years, even let's say even the constraints of the past six months, how much room did they have? Seems so, different. So I think with the so current what would that different have looked like? Right. With the current account surplus, you should have started thinking about importing foodstuffs which were short in supply before they went up to 14% in rural areas. You should have start, uh, imported things which which have, which there is a constraint. You can buy them elsewhere. You are, for once, your balance of payments is in a slightly better position because we're not spending much on oil or whatever else. And the oil price of oil has fallen. So that would have been an immediate reaction. Start importing quickly rather than when prices are zero. So, um, just, just take three three items. Take vegetables and and uh, lentils. Take uh, wheat and take uh, sugar cane. I mean, first, what they do is they export wheat and then they say we are short. Let's start importing it again. I mean, these are very clear lapses in ways of understanding how the economy works. Okay, you're saying, okay, two and a half years down the track, they should have learned about how to go about it. Six months ago, four months ago, let's say just, just in July, they should have said, we've got a shortfall of wheat coming up. The price of uh, sugar seems to be rising. Let's start importing. We have a current account surplus. So something as simple as that. So I think these are measures which have not been looked at precisely for political economy constraints, precisely because there are people who benefit by prices rising and it's not, and the common people suffer. So I would have okay. just looked at it at a very short term place. Okay. In a moment, Mifta, I'm just giving you a heads up. I'm going to throw all this at you and tell you that here's the government's narrative. How do you respond to it? But before I do that, I do want to get Asim's views. Uh, on this as well, Asim, within the the constraints, you've heard us all discuss this. What I mean, do you? How realistic is it that any other government would have done anything uh, much differently 
in the in these circumstances, and we would have been hurting a little bit less, perhaps. Yeah, look, I mean, I think I I tend to agree with Akbar, right? Like, the, it's this is a glow again. I I can't help but sort of take it to a global comparison. Like all over the world, governments are floundering, um, and so certainly you don't want to suggest that that any one particular government uh, would have done. You know, would, would, uh, there is some rocket science solution that they could have come up with different. But yeah, I mean, I think partly the problem is that there's so much bluster and so much pomp and so much like insistence that somehow uh, they are made of different stuff and that everybody else that has ever preceded them is just sort of some, you know, the typical the corruption motif and all the rest of it. And I think that bluster and that sort of just inability to, to, to look at simple, obvious, within the constraints, obvious. I think partly what's also happened is that there's, in fact, there's no, not even recognition now. Like, look at, again, I can't help but think about the WEF session the other day, right, where it's sort of, the, the whole narrative around that is that Pakistan somehow has actually done much better. And, and I think that these are, this, this, these self, it's partly a narrative that is generated by the government itself, Partly, you know, I think there's, there's, some, there's some global buy-in to that as well. And that actually prevents an honest appraisal of one's own shortcomings. And that then reinforces <laughs> you think, you know, basic... You don't, um, you don't think it's true? Pakistan's economy has not rebounded back faster than uh, its uh, regional peers. Pakistan has not avoided the no, fatalities no, I, and I, the widespread... I, I think that... Certainly, certainly. I, I don't think there's. I don't think there's any. I mean, if there's the stats suggest that, I don't want to suggest that we should be spin doctors and say that's not happened. But that's not because of some remarkable, uh, you know, uh, spin doctrine within the government that 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 none of us are willing to 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 acknowledge. I don't think that's what's going on here. I think there's there's this is a separate debate entirely. Why we're why we're figure, why we're sort of infections lower? To what extent did we actually acknowledge? Or to what extent our statistics are accurate or not? So this is not, I'm not suggesting that one should ignore those comparative stats, but I think what that means is that in 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 sort of tooting your own horn or blowing your own trumpet, what you are not doing is acknowledging what is going badly wrong and what is Akbar saying. Perhaps you could have ameliorated slightly differently. I think I want to suggest one other thing as well here: these problems sure. that are building up and that are sort of now just. At the, at this, we're at the tip of the iceberg. I don't think that the pandemic's fallouts are even, as of now, entirely apparent. I think this will play out now over the next 18 to 24 months. And I think that in Pakistan's case, like, like the region at large, I think what we, our, our biggest brewing crisis is that we have so many young people. If you've observed in the last few days, there's a bunch of young people coming out in the streets about everything from like being forced to take exams indoors to... And, and these are relatively affluent, you know, middle class, sort of well, well healed. And I think this is a this is a crisis. Where, and yet the government is still going to say, oh, we are the party of youth. I mean, those sorts of slogans don't cut it right, basically. Um, and they catch up with you. And I think that is perhaps what distinguishes this regime from others. I'm not so convinced that all other regimes have done a lot better or, or, or not. But. Nevertheless, this, this regime is distinct precisely because it is unwilling at any rate to accept that there is a problem. It's a, it's a, there's a deeper structural problem, but there's also in the prosecution of, of economic policy in the last two years, there's including the fact that it caters to the same rent-seeking elites that it insists that it has nothing to do with. So these obvious, ridiculous contradictions, um, I think, is what then subject it to more criticism um, uh, in the way that perhaps we are engaging this in right now. Does, it does come under a great deal of very harsh criticism of uh, the sort that we have just seen. So, but, Mr., you know, if I was with the government, which I'm not, but, uh, but of course I was, you know what I would say to you after listening and after having been made to hear all this? I would turn to you and say you have some nerve, Mr., you have some nerve because we came into power dealing with a fiscal train wreck, dealing with an external account deficit that has nearly brought us to the verge of bankruptcy. Pakistan's foreign exchange reserves were de declining so fast you could see it happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, 
we had no choice but to undertake some of the harshest adjustment measures ever undertaken under an IMF program, or at least undertaken since the year 2000. Um, or, uh, or maybe the 2008 facility would also be comparable. On to and right about when we began to do all that, we were hit by COVID, and we had to literally invent a response to an unprecedented crisis within a matter of days. And right as we were getting around to doing that, and we pulled the country through COVID without taking it into a catastrophe of the sort that was seen in Iran or <clears throat> even in India, while avoiding all of that and bringing about some kind of a recovery from the post-COVID era, you and your friends in the opposition suddenly launched this movement against us and started criticizing us for the very things we had to do to clean up your mess. Now that takes a lot of nerve. That's what I would say to you, Mr. <clears throat> what would you say? Your mic is on mute. I'm sorry. You're going to have to unmute yourself if you want to be heard. I, I, I would say you're wrong, absolutely wrong. Uh, let me just say this, uh, first of all, because you've said this two or three times now, uh, that this government has tackled the fiscal deficit that we've left. No, it has not. Uh, uh, when our last year, the fiscal deficit was 6.5% of GDP. It has since actually gone to 9.1% 9 9 of GDP in the first year and 8.1%, they say, in the second year. And this year, again, it's going to go beyond 8%. So this is the highest GDP, uh, highest deficits uh, in the history of Pakistan. So that's first of all. So, so, so they have not tackled any of the fiscal things that you're talking about. They've not made any hard decisions in terms of cutting any government expenditures or raising revenues. In fact, revenues actually are flat in spite of 10% inflation over the last two years. Uh, they've not increased taxation. After a 40% devaluation, they've not increased taxation. So, so, so in terms of uh, any fiscal adjustments, it's completely a failure. Uh, now you come back to, let's look, talk about current account. I think the recession that this economy has been forced into was forced by PTI by doing two or three things, which is number one, but in, incredibly fast, rapid devaluation to 168 now, and, and, and you know how much the currency fluctuated. There was no need uh, to do this because there was no benefit to this. They could have easily adjusted this over time more slowly and, 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 and gotten much better results. Uh, number two, they actually spoke, talk our economy down into a recession by the prime minister saying that everybody is a chore except for him. Uh, uh, you know, uh, saying in, in uh, out of the uh, you know, in in international conferences, these things they've stopped CPAC, saying that we are going to stop every CPAC project. Radak Daud said this. Asad Umar is saying every day that we are at the verge of bankruptcy. I mean, they've never talked about their own businesses like this. You know, uh, Descon is a very large borrower. Eng uh, Engro was a very large borrower, but Asad never said when he was an Engro CEO that his company was near the verge of bankruptcy. Why would he say this about Pakistan? Uh, I mean, this this is just ridiculous, the things that they've said and the things they've done. Actually. Uh, then you talk about, I mean, 3.7% of the money spent by poor in Pakistan is on wheat. Uh, wheat products, you know, uh, why is 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 flour so expensive when the production was only ten percent below and more, uh, and the production was more than enough for our consumption? You've actually exported more than a million tons of sugar at forty-eight rupees per kilo, and now are importing back at ninety rupees a kilo. This is this is not just mismanagement. This is criminal negligence. If 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 it's just negligence, it's if and if it's more than that, and I think it is more than that, uh, then you know they've they've brought crony capitalism to a new level. So the economy today is down because of what PTI has done, and they have not done anything. Coming back again to current account surplus, two or three things have happened. One, imports have gone down. One is the reduction in oil prices, but the second is the absolute, you know, standstill in growth. There is no growth now in the Pakistan economy, hence the imports have gone down. But even after a 40% 40 devaluation, the exports have not gone up. The highest export in the last three years was in the year that PMLN was last year. Uh, in the first year, when there was no COVID, their exports were $500 million below us. In the second year, when there were, uh, when there were uh, uh, COVID, their exports was $1.8 billion below the, their own previous year. 
And again, in the first four months of this year, the exports are down. The reason you have current account surplus is because of the remittance that are coming, $500 million extra every month. And that's because there is no traveling going on. 20 lakh Pakistanis used to go for Umrah, for Hajj, and there used to be a lot of Hawala and Hundi because of FATF and other reasons. That's much less now. There's much less demand for dollars by Pakistanis. As imports come down, the demand for over-invoice dollars, uh, you know, demand for under-invoicing, uh, if imports, that, that demand goes down. That is the reason. Once you have travel start, uh, and you will see that, you know, the demand for dollars will go up. And again, you know, the dollars that you can buy in, in the curb market and interbank market will go down. Um, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope that we continue to have these higher remittances. But that's also happened in Bangladesh. Coming to COVID, there, I don't know what's going on. I'm not a doctor. There is some, uh, I don't know if there, we have immunity. But, but if, Pakistan was only closed down for 15 days in March. Since April, all factories are running. Uh, you know, massages are on. Uh, shadis are happening. Shadi halls were closed, but shadis are happening. Congregations happen. Uh, there has been no uh, COVID precautions in Pakistan. And I, I mean, I go to all these, uh, you know, uh, not so affluent areas of Karachi is part of a Muslim League, uh, you know, sort of vote mobilizing effort and all that. And, and there are no precautions also. Uh, and, 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 and so, so even in Bangladesh, COVID is not really um, spread so much and, and neither in Thailand. So, the, you know, so something else is going on. This is not a government policy that has reduced the impact of COVID in Pakistan. Uh, and, and, and in fact, the fiscally, they actually benefited. They got $1.5 billion extra from IMF. Uh, and then, and then um, $2 billion were, were, were um, uh, of loan repayments were deferred by uh, G20 countries uh, or was it G13 or something, I mean, of the rich countries. Uh, then the IMF program has been actually in, 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 in suspension, which means that you can still continue to get loans from World Bank and Asian Development Bank, even though you're not part of the IMF program. So actually, uh, COVID has actually really bailed them out fiscally. And, 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 and these guys are spending money and, and borrowing and, and indebting the nation as if this were the last year of government. I mean, you know, in the, in, in the dev, I mean, look at what is happening to circular debt, 60 billion rupees a month. Uh, why has transmission and distribution losses gone up? If they were so efficient or, or honorable or honest and non-corrupt, uh, you know, the bill collection okay. rate has gone down. So uh, I think that uh, the, the, this government, mm -hmm. this government has really not done anything to uh, address any of the weaknesses in our economy that we left. Uh, and and in, 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 in any, in, in, indeed, they've actually made things much worse. Okay, many thanks for that uh, as well, Mr. I'm sure we could go on and on about uh, this particular conversation that has been sparked uh, by the uh, examining the track record of the present government and comparing it with that of yours. Uh, lots to be said on that on that score. But unfortunately, we are at the end of our time over here. So I want to thank all of you for agreeing to participate in this uh, in this panel. And uh, I think collectively we've been able to uh, actually come up with a fairly comprehensive menu of uh, for why there is a consistent failure in Pakistan to be able to, to address poverty and inequality in a substantive and in a meaningful and in a sustainable way. <clears throat> uh, part of that owes itself to lack of imagination in the policy uh, conversation in this country. It just does not seem to be on the agenda. Part of it owes itself to, uh, uh, or at least not, not on the agenda to the extent that perhaps it should be. Uh, it it owes itself to the fact of a uh, uh, weakened state capacity and uh, having to build the kind of kind of capacity that you need in order to be able to undertake such a task. Part of it owes itself to the hard binding constraints within which uh, successive governments find themselves in, uh, whether their time is consumed with day-to-day -day firefighting um, or uh, beyond that, uh, to what extent they are in fact beholden to elite interests. Uh, that in some cases have brought them into power and in some cases are necessary for them to uh, sustain themselves in power. And without serving those interests, they're not going to be able to make much headway. Uh, and, uh, and the constant struggles and fights around the legit, uh, political legitimacy question. So the political economy holds us back. The imagination, our own imagination holds us back. And the tools with which we have to wage this fight uh, holds us back. But other than that, there's uh, not much else. Uh, holding this country back from giving to the poor and allowing that largesse to percolate up in the form of demand and letting the elites sort of fend for themselves in the face of that demand and decide where to invest. Uh, 
in order to make their uh, to, to make their money. Um, thanks again to uh, to all of you, and thanks to the uh, uh, the audience for participating, and uh, many thanks to Jinnah Institute for the ideas conclave and for inviting me to host it.